Welcome today to the Commercial Disco and welcome to Michael Biersick, the Professor of Quantum Physics and Quantum Technology at Sydney University and uh, more recently CEO and founder of Q-Control, the quantum uh, startup. Uh, Michael, welcome. I wanted to, to start today um, with news, I suppose. Last Friday, the federal government um, unveiled a, a miscalculation in their, their uh, the support package over coronavirus. Um, and specifically on JobKeeper, we now find that we'll be spending $60 billion less. I wonder if you've got a view on um, the way that universities have been largely excluded from JobKeeper and whether you think you can find a, a home for that $60 billion if it were to be spent. Well, indeed. I mean, I'm, I'm a little sympathetic to the government in that this seems like it was very much an administrative issue rather than a policy issue that emerged. Now, I guess the question is, what, what do we do next? Uh, there's a, an underspend, I suppose, of, of this pretty reasonable amount. Uh, and in the intervening time between when JobKeeper was announced and, and now this discovery, we have learned that there are gaps in the coverage. Uh, there are a lot of people in the arts, casual employees, long-term casual employees, who, based on the structure of the policy, are excluded and are clearly suffering based on the economic impacts. And just trying to reopen faster doesn't resolve those problems because the jobs are gone. Universities fall into a similar boat in some ways that they were uh, excluded uh, initially and then through subsequent revisions of the policy uh, were more or less guaranteed to be kept out by some what you could call moving goalposts. Uh, you know, obviously, I think this is not the best way to set policy. I think uh, certainty is the most important thing. Uh, whenever we're trying to craft policy, you hear from the business community all the time and universities, I think, are entitled to the same kind of certainty. They met the rules. They were entitled to uh, uh, claim under the rules of JobKeeper, and then the rules were changed just to make sure they could not claim it. Um, uh, I'm not going to get into why that happened. I would say it's not the best way to execute policy. And now that we understand where we are in terms of the budgetary impact of this particular program, uh, and we've seen the effects on various sectors, like you know, people are starting to be stood down at certain universities or, or required to find ex extra work right outside of their, uh, their typical FTE, even as academics, that it makes sense to revisit the early decisions made across sectors. And I think, you know, universities should be included in that. It's a shame uh, you won't get into why that uh, policy is the way it is, because that was going to be my next question. But um, I, I guess uh, everyone will have their own view on why, why governments do these yeah. things. I like to think about thing, talk about things for which I have evidence, and I have no evidence one way or another. All I know is that the goalposts moved a lot. I guess I would ask, I would ask this, um, given uh, the difficulties with foreign students right now and, uh, you know, the, it does seem that universities are getting a kind of a, a double whammy. Um, if we have kind of a, across industries calls for greater um, funding of innovation, greater funding of research, and that would, that would include funding going to, to universities, is that a way to provide that kind of support or is it a se completely separate issue? Well, I, I do think it's useful as a, as a completely general statement to segregate issues of the acute crisis going on right now, this public health emergency that engenders uh, major economic uh, negative impacts from the long-term policy positions that we take. Now, obviously, you know, we shouldn't let a good crisis go to waste. We should revisit things. Uh, I think we're still a little bit in the, uh, in the crisis mode. Um, taking a step back, however, I would say that there has been a pretty sustained assault in Australia and around the world in Western democracies on funding levels uh, from the public sector to universities. This spans research, general uh, budgets and the like. And uh, a lot of the challenges we see in innovation policy, um, in commercialization and the like, really frankly could be largely fixed by returning to historic levels of public sector support for a public good organization like a university. And I think ultimately that's something that we want to revisit uh, in policy. So I guess I'm going to talk now, I'm going to ask you now about this um, CSIRO uh, roadmap, quantum roadmap, which is interesting because just to the point you've made just now, um, the, the roadmap and I guess the, the funding cuts that you've referred to arrive at a time when globally investment in quantum research That's is right. going through the roof. Like it, That's it, right. It, it has really taken off, particularly I think last two, three years. So 
Uh, so, so there we are. First of all, so Cathy Foley, the chief scientist at CSIRO, is saying um, for Australia, there's a potential $4 billion industry and 16,000 high value employees by 2040. I think that's uh, $86 billion uh, globally, which would give us around 5% of that market, which is, which is more of the market than we, we would normally uh, get in a, new, in a new area. Can I ask you, firstly, what do you think of those numbers? Um, and, and secondly, what's, what's your view on how we maximise Australia's participation in that new industry? I think the first comment I want to make uh, that even underlines all of that is we've heard a lot about uh, the cyber roadmap and we've heard about how Kathy and her team have put this forward. That actually paints kind of the wrong picture of what happened. Um, and I don't mean this to undermine Kathy or Cyro in any way, but actually to build up that this is not a top-down government or entity saying this is how we're going to proceed. This was completely bottom-up driven, where the community got together and asked Cyro to lead this initiative as an impartial third party who could do a dispassionate evaluation of the global situation, of the Australian situation, and make policy recommendations. So this is important, I think, because it means that the community is behind this effort. This is, this is not being foisted upon us. Now, as to the particular numbers, I think they did a, a not unreasonable economic analysis. It's aligned with a variety of other uh, predictions that have been put out by organizations like BCG. Uh, the question, of course, is how much Australia captures, and that's highly, highly dependent on what policy settings we have, right? It could all go offshore this year or next year. That's totally possible if we get the policy prescriptions wrong. But the, the uh, most important takeaway message is how much potential there is. And I, I frankly think that the capture rate could be way higher if we just got uh, you know, ahead of ourselves and uh, took advantage of the long-term strategic investment that's been made in Australia instead of playing a nationalist game. Right? The, the, a lot of the discussion becomes, you know, let's build a wall around everything and make it Australians, uh, you know, Australian technology for Australians. That's, it's just a nonsense proposition for global technology. Q-Control, the company I run, has only one customer in Australia. We have a, a lot of customers overseas, and that's based on the nature of the work that we're doing. So having this open perspective uh, is, I think, going to be an essential part of ensuring that we capture value, and we really have a huge opportunity to do so. So just let's, let's look historically just for a minute. Um, Australia has developed uh, considerable quantum uh, talent in, uh, and, and capability, I guess you'd say, certainly in the, in the, uh, the, the research phase. How, how did that come about? For, for a start. So if you look at that historically, like how did we get into this position before we start talking about how we capture sure. uh, where we are? Serendipity and vision. Um, you know, I think it's how it always is. Uh, the, it, it really goes back to the 1990s um, with the development of this algorithm called Shor's algorithm. Uh, that was the first big potential theoretical algorithm to be run on quantum computers, this new kind of computer. Uh, that led to the development of a really big funding initiative in the United States that was sponsored by the National Security Agency, the NSA. It's one of these uh, security agencies, uh, but it was their first ever public uh, funding. It was university research that they were going to support, totally open to ask the question whether this kind of computer could really be built. And at the time, there was a lot of very good, what you would just traditionally call condensed matter physics or atomic physics, optical physics in Australia. and one or two really visionary people who had been doing work that was related to what could that would later become quantum computing, people like Jared Milburn and, uh, and Bob Clark, saw an opportunity to build something domestically to, to unify the capabilities that were on shore and then respond to these, these global uh, calls for, for research proposals. Uh, so Bob Clark led a uh, 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 research submission to the NSA. It was successful. He then leveraged that to get matching funds from the Commonwealth government in Australia. This was, you know, a lot of money at the time. It was uh, many, many millions of dollars, which was way different than the scale you would see in Australian Research Council funding, etc. And that became the precursor uh, in the late 90s, 97, I think, of what would later become the Center for Quantum Computer Technology at UNSW, uh, which is now led by Bob's successor, uh, Michelle Simmons. Now, in the intervening time, the strength of that research and the participation of Australian researchers in a really big US-led but global program built the profile of Australians in quantum computing in particular. I mean, the Australians 
who would traditionally perhaps go to Australian research agencies, were now going to a global funding pool with talent from all over the world. And we would get together once a year. Now, I was funded as a PhD student under this program. I was then uh, later funded as a primary investigator at, in my faculty role under the same program. And in fact, I came to Australia because I got to know uh, David Riley, who was a postdoc at UNSW at the time. He's now a professor at Sydney and runs the Microsoft effort. Uh, you know, it was the it was the entry of Australian researchers into that global program that really set the ball rolling uh, for the next two decades, really, and it brings us to where we are today. So, I mean, that's a it's a fascinating history. So, first of all, um, the Australian government at some point had to, had to place a large bet on, uh, and it did this kind of bottom up because a couple of researchers had had pressed that case. Is that fair to say? That's my understanding, yes. And, and then uh, from an intelligence agency perspective, without going, without going too, too deep into it, that's obviously a, a national security priority across, um, you know, Five Eyes Alliance partners. Uh, yeah, but I want, to be, I want to be clear. This was not any kind of Five Eyes program. It was not a secret program. 100% open university research all over the world. And it turns out some of the bigger players were non-traditional research actors. Australia was one. Austria was another, right? Leveraging capability that they had as well. So, but so to my understanding, this was DARPA. So, oh, NSA, still, NSA, not NSA. DARPA. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, so a big bet on a on a big new thing, and and here we are, fifteen or twenty years later, and and uh, and it, it seems to be going quite well. So, what from from your point of view, as someone who who kind of straddles uh, startup uh, re- and and research, uh, and obviously deep tech. Um, what's the next immediate step and then what's a medium term? Uh, in terms of the roadmap, I think we really need a funding allocation and we need to do it in a strategic way. Uh, the biggest concern that I have, well, I guess I have two concerns. One is that nothing happens, right? That's obviously uh, quite possible given the current economic climate. The other possibility uh, is that uh, Australia takes a really nationalist perspective, says everything is internal and uh, then they build what you could uh, pejoratively call an armada of canoes. They take a big pot of money and then they divide it up. They give 100,000 to you and 100,000 to you and 100,000 to you and 100,000 to you to make sure all the Australian groups get a little bit so nobody is politically put out. Uh, and then nothing happens because $100,000 a year does zero in, a, in any kind of research or business setting. But that's the, the traditional approach. We need to be willing to say this is a winning area but not so myopic to say that there will be only one winner. Because if there is only one winner, then everybody loses, right? We've missed an opportunity. Even in the United States, you have giant tech companies like Google, Microsoft, IBM, and AWS all competing against each other for this. Competition is an important part of this, both domestically and internationally. And we need to make sure that we foster an entire diverse ecosystem that spans people building hardware, uh, people building applications, you know, software, and then all the things in between, the, the kind of infrastructure software that we build, control engineering solutions, new kinds of technology and the like. All of that needs to be supported in a big way. So I guess uh, there's, there's two sides to that. When you're talking about a, a, an increase in funding, you're talking about to the actual researchers, like to the, to the core researchers, but you're also talking about um, to the commercialization effort. I mean, yeah. when, you, when you talk about AWS and Google, the, the commercial enterprises, it's a different thing, right? Well, uh, so I am not talking about just boosting research. Um, that is part of the equation. It's important that the academic sector have a, a critical role here. But what really is missing is the bridging into the commercial side. And uh, what you see in places like the United States with very successful major deep tech integration into, say, defense or intelligence communities is that the government is an early customer. The government provides either bridging support by direct things like SBA, uh, small business authority loans or small business authority grants. And it becomes a purchaser of the technology produced by those organizations. In the UK, the quantum technology, uh, I can't remember what it's called, hub or roadmap or whatever it was, uh, set up, yes, that there would be research funding, no doubt, uh, it's part of the equation, but there would also be a large tranche of funding to support early stage startups who wanted to commercialize either totally new concepts or things that were emerging from public sector research. Those are the organizations that frankly have the largest uh, 
probability of delivering economic prosperity, despite the importance that I, it's always there of long-term uh, academic open research, we do need support for this new kind of translational research, which has never really been supported well in Australia. Yeah, so two things there. I, I guess government has, in this country anyway, has not been great as a, as a buyer of locally produced technology, and that goes across lots of industries um, and is a source of great frustration to many. Um, but can I... Okay, two, two things. Firstly, who's your uh, only customer in Australia? Is that something that you can talk about? And is it a government customer? I'd... No, it's a private sector customer, but uh, no, I'm not at liberty to talk about okay, that. Okay, private time. sector customer. Uh, okay, so just in terms of that funding model, when you talk about supporting the, the translation or commercial translation, are you talking about funding that would sit somewhere between what would be a university grant and a main sequence? Like, is it more money to a VC, a government-supported VC, or is there a stage? No, before? there's, there's a, in my view, uh, in my view, the early motion for the Commonwealth government to be a limited partner in main sequence was extremely valuable. It, it made a statement about government priorities. It made a statement about what could be done in Australia, but I don't think there's any shortage of LP funding to venture capital organizations right now. That's not the issue. What is an issue is if you're going to start deep tech companies, right, and do private sector venture capital like we have at Q Control, there's an expectation of certain time horizons. There's an expectation of product development as well as uh, commercial sales and engagement as the company grows. But when it's deep tech focused, when it's not selling wine by a mobile application or something, when it's deep tech focused and there can be potentially two or three or four years of ongoing research and development, not just to commercialize something, but to continue building capability that really makes it a commercially viable product as opposed to a, an idea or a, an early prototype with commercial potential. That's where research funding is essential. And that's where in the U.S. there are things like the SBIR program, STTR, a Small Business Innovative Research Program, that give you know million dollar, multi million dollar scale uh, grants to individual performers in order to do this uh, commercialization translation process of advanced technology. Now there are similar things in Australia, uh, like the CRCP but they're unnecessarily onerous in my view, in terms of the structure. They, you must involve this many university researchers. You must involve two SMEs plus one organization that's above hundred. You know, all these rules mean that you're just doing administrative tap dancing instead of solving the problem that you want to solve. And sometimes a small business has an idea that they can commercialize and translate themselves they don't need a research partner at a university to help them with it. They've got the internal talent, but a million dollars would totally change their long-term commercial prospects and turn them in from a company that you know maybe will last two or three years with five people into a company that employs a thousand people down the down the line. You know, this this reasonably small amounts of money can be transformative for early businesses. So let's. I, I'm going to move to Q Control now. Um, properly. Can I just ask you what, like your personal journey, journey toward starting that company? You were obviously a pr professor at research at Sydney. You're doing this stuff. You're building software and building a machine in order to do your research. And then you've, you've taken that out. Is that a reasonable snapshot? Uh, kind of. Uh, I, so I, 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 was, I was a professor of quantum physics and quantum technology at the University of Sydney. Uh, I, I'm an experimentalist, so we would build things. We would build quantum computers. We're funded by this NSA program that I've talked about for years, many others as well. And uh, in, the, in the context of doing research towards the development of useful quantum computers, we discovered and developed a number of, uh, of capabilities that we deemed valuable. Now, uh, at the time, in, in 2017, I was very strongly of the opinion that venture capital moved a little bit too early in, uh, in quantum technology, in quantum computing in particular. Um, I, I remain of the view that venture capital probably moved too early. But once it started moving, well, that, you know, the finger is out of the dam, as they say. And uh, uh, I made a decision that I had to move then. So in mid-2017, after talking with a number of investors around the, uh, around the place, I started talking more seriously with Main Sequence about what a targeted commercial activity could look like. And that was the genesis of Q Control, focused on 
control engineering products and services for uh, quantum technology. So I guess so. I guess this is my this is my question. Like, did you have a fortuitous meeting with uh, someone who was a commercialization expert, or did you were you in a program that was formalized? No. Nope. Um, did you always have a a desire to to you know com- commercialize some of this tech? Like, no. Nope. I mean, even as as a professor, I, I would imagine there are professors out there who would not only not necessarily recognize commercial value in something they've developed, wouldn't really care necessarily a great deal if there was that would be for someone yeah, because else. it's it's for someone else because we need a diversity of uh of both personalities and activities right if everybody just did commercialization nobody would solve problems that matter 50 years from now yeah um no what it, uh, so i didn't go through any programs um no accelerators nothing like that i had this idea of brewing and i actually went to a meeting in uh in uh munich um and It was a venture capital meeting uh, across the quantum industry uh, sponsored by a VC. And it had everybody there who you might call a little bit maybe commercially minded or industrially minded. Uh, My peers from around the world, um, you know, a a set of them who who are less pure research focused. And what that meeting indicated to me was that times had changed, that the field was transitioning from pure academic research into something different. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted to ever have a piece of it, now was the time. And so I came back from that meeting and the next day, actually, I think I wrote an email while I was there uh, to the main sequence guys. I said, I want to do this. I want to do it right now. And, uh, you know, that was in June. Uh, We announced the company as we announced closing of the capital round November 2nd. So in a very short period of time, we went from, hey, I want to do something to company exists, start hiring, here's money. Right. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, it was fun. I, it's kind of fortuitous that main sequence was even there. It was a, I think you're, oh. in the, you're in the first cohort of. Um, yeah, that's right. Uh, the, that's right. Uh, that's right. We were. We were. I don't know if we were the first deal they closed, but we were within the first one or two or three that they that they closed. It was absolutely fortuitous. But the the fact is, it it came down to being able to talk to investors who understood um, that as someone coming from academia, a I had a different experience. B, I had different motivations, right? I was not, you know, there, there's a joke I use a lot that uh, in the US there are these things called credit reports, right? You can get your credit report from, uh, you know, Equifax or whatever, and you're entitled to a free one every year. But the joke I make is, uh, you know, you can make a lot of money selling free credit reports to old ladies who don't know they can get them for free. And I, I actually saw a lot of consumer tech in that light that a lot of it is just nonsense. And yeah, people will get rich, there's no question, but it had absolutely zero appeal to me. And uh, finding investors who understood what did appeal to me, building really trend, you know, transformative technology in the private sector, uh, you know, solving extremely hard problems, uh, meeting those people was the most important bit. And that's, a, uh, you know, I'd hate to say, um Capital is not a problem for you because I suppose everyone can have, have more capital in a venture like this. But uh, in terms of your, your, your VC partners, um, Incutel from Silicon Valley, uh, Main Sequence, Horizons, the uh, Hong Kong Lee Cushing's uh, vehicle, Square Peg Australian, um, Sierra and Excel. Have I, that's... Uh, Sierra, Sierra is in Silicon Valley and uh, Sequoia Capital. Sequoia Capital yeah. in uh, in Silicon Valley, so that's um, that's quite a roster, uh, I suppose. I mean, the the latest announcement was Incutel, and we've spoken about this before, but it, it does circle us back to kind of um, the an intelligence community related entity. Yeah, Incutel is. I mean, Incutel is a uh, not for profit investor whose initial client uh, years ago and initial funding body was the CIA, and then it became a multi-entity, multi-agency organization uh, that ensures that the technology being developed in the private sector has visibility within the government. Right, and which is exactly what, where you would like the visibility to be anyway. Well, I think it's, it's pretty clear that in quantum technology, uh, government support in defense and intelligence communities is going to be important. It's not just in, in quantum computing, it's in quantum sensing and, and uh, standoff detection, all these things. Okay. Government, government engagement will be essential. Okay, and can I ask you on that? Does main sequence play that role? Like it is slightly different. It's 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 out of a the the kind of the national research agency. But 
Um, but it, and it's kind of managed by uh, what would be private sector VC, if you want a better word. So, 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 no, they're not the same. Main Sequence is a private sector venture capital limited partnership. They're a VC. Their initial LP was the CIRO. And uh, then, you know, they, they raised like $100 million from CIRO. And I think they've raised $150 million from non-CIRO entities. So they're majority not CIRO. Uh, but they do maintain, by virtue of how they were started and the mandate to support public sector, public, uh, sector research translation, they maintain a close relationship with, uh, with CSIRO and they provide uh, advice to different government bodies. I'll let, I'll let them talk to you more about how they work. InQtel has a slightly different role. They have a different strategic mandate. They are not a VCLP in the standard way in that they're a not-for-profit. Um, different structures but they both have a role to play in ensuring uh, translation of public sector research, but also ensuring that private sector technology is visible within the government. Yeah, so, I mean, it's fascinating. I think in they tell, they don't, they're not for profit in so much as they're not expected to return money to, to shareholders, obviously, the shareholder being um, their original uh, shareholders, but they, are, they reinvest they they just reinvest. It has become a self perpetuating fund. Is sure, I mean, and been very successful doing it. Uh, and and Horizons actually does the same thing. Horizons is a foundation. It's the Li Ka Shing Foundation, and uh, Horizons is exceptionally successful. Uh, early investments in Spotify and Zoom, like all these tremendous companies. Facebook, I think that's and Facebook as well. Uh, and all of that capital gets reinvested because it's a foundation. Every single dollar goes right back into the foundation. It's pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, this model, it can work, especially when we're talking about deep tech and uh, very long-term projects. Horizons wants to change the world. That's what they want to do. And we fit nicely, uh, fortunately, in, in that, uh, in that uh, view of the world. Um, but InQtel has been important to us because they've also been part of a, uh, an initiative to take the InQtel model, which is very successful in the United States, and through a trilateral relationship with the UK and Australia, help bring those lessons abroad. So InQtel actually works directly with the Australian government as well uh, in helping them understand what we do. Yeah, look, I mean, I get, and that would be incredibly valuable, I, I guess, to you, but also to other deep tech providers. I was, that was going to be my next question. How do you, I guess, uh, I mean, how do you find that translator between you know, like between deep tech startup and uh, and government in Australia, and in particular, can in particular, can you talk to me about the defence sector, which I would think, um, you know, might have an interest in this area? Yeah, um, I think you know, there's this is new to Australia. That's the most important message. That the trilateral relationship behind this InQtel Australia US UK thing. Uh, is based on the premise that there are lessons to be learned. Um, so first of all, it's fantastic that the Australian public sector is recognizing that everything is not, uh, not perfect as it is. Um, I think that the biggest thing we see is that government has not been a customer of uh, domestic technology, as you described earlier, and that the timescales associated with uh, engagement with the private sector are not commensurate with what's required in startup land. Um, government procurement is extremely slow. This is true, unfortunately, in defense as well. It's generally contract negotiation over the better part of a year, if you're lucky. Um, generally, it will go well over a year. Uh, you know, that kind of acquisition cycle is the cycle in which startups are born, live, and die. And uh, the idea that new funding routes and new funding mechanisms that facilitate better engagement is, uh, is an important message, but it is, it is, to be fair, one that's being recognized. Tanya Monroe is the new chief defense scientist is talking about this. I think their new motto is more together or something. And, and that's focused on the idea of better engagement because traditionally in Australia, defense research was handled both in terms of internal activity and external funding by an organization called DSTG, or or DSTO in the past, Defense Science Technology Organization, then group. Uh, and, and this organization has to wear many hats. It has to provide strategic advice. It has to do internal work. It has to uh, fund research. That was a bit of a challenge. And I think uh, this more together strategy is suggesting uh, more of an outward focus instead of just an inward defense only focus. And uh, I'm very excited about that. I hope it opens new opportunities through streamlined vehicles 
in order to allow us to engage with defense without going through a 24-month acquisition cycle. All right, I'm conscious of time. Um, Michael Bissick, thanks very much for joining us today. But I wanted to, I guess I wanted to finish with a fairly open-ended question and I, I ask a lot of... It's not a good way to, you know, do a time box. <laughs> Well, we'll look, we'll, we'll see. I, look, I wanted to, to ask you in terms of Q-Control, just as a kind of a, a microcosm of, a, of, of deep tech and the quantum sector, what's, uh, what's your biggest uh, roadblock in terms of a government policy? What's your biggest challenge? What, is government, what should government be doing more of? What should they be doing less of? Um, you know, we covered some of this in, um, during the interview. But to, to finish off, what, what have we not talked about that you want to be seeing done at a policy level? Uh, so let me, I'll, I'll even take off my Q control hat and I'll only, I'll try to be uh, altruistic for the community. Uh, I really want to see a change in the way we look at research commercialization at the university level. Um, universities are, are like the redheaded stepchild of uh, the sector right now, which is really unfortunate. Um, and you know, they're being pushed very hard to commercialize, which, which we understand. At the same time, they're having the rug pulled out from under them in terms of funding for research support. So the natural thing to do is to try to A, commercialize and B, make revenue off doing so. Um, and that approach by which one locks up IP and then tries to license it out to high bidders, uh, it's just the death of, of actual innovation, right? In fact, so much so, I was reading up on some old documents yesterday that I found that in 2017, uh, Blackbird had a statement on their, on their website. And it's so good. I think, I, you know, I think it even warrants me reading it to you. Yep. Um, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a statement of values and, and what they like. Uh, but one of the statements of values, again, 2017, no university spin outs, no Perth stockbrokers. We shudder at the thought of patented technology being handed off to an experienced team looking to commercialize through a backdoor listing by a Perth stockbroker shilling a reverse takeover of a failed mining company. Now, that's, uh, it's obviously quite tongue in cheek, but it's, uh, it's indicative of what the general model of research commercialization has been. Treat the technology as the asset and then shill that to some third party in order to make money. It fundamentally doesn't work. And right now, we need to change the policy settings such that universities are not incentivized to pursue that approach. They're responding in a totally rational way to the restrictions they have. They can't charge more fees because they're regulated. They can't do more of this. They can't do more of that. Uh, and so the, the opportunities that are there, obviously, international students and potential research commercialization licensing deals. But the, the idea of the founder being involved in that has been completely removed. So we need to change policy settings around research translation to allow universities to perform their core functions of generating and disseminating knowledge, and then ensuring that translation of technology does not become a value capture exercise. It becomes an exercise in delivering public good. And that can be done by saying, you're a founder, you're an academic, you're a founder, you want to start a commercial entity, here, go, take the IP, go and build something and say nice things about the University of X. Right? That's, that's the model that's been taken at the University of Waterloo. It's called Create Our Own Content. It's been exceptionally successful. The Waterloo, Toronto, the area between Waterloo and Toronto has become a real tech startup hub uh, in quantum technology and all sorts of other things. You would never expect it, but it, it's really based on the fact that there, there are no roadblocks to scientists and researchers building new commercial ventures. And I think we need to set policy here in the right way in order to facilitate that. Right now, all of the language is about IP, 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 which is idiotic because nobody invests in a patent portfolio. People invest in founders when you're talking about the private sector. So I want to see that, that, that transition as a matter of urgency. I think that's a good place to leave this. Michael Biersick, thank you very much for, for joining us today on the Commercial Disco. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Michael.